These are cutting boards. They're thin sheets of plastic, and well, they're actually not all that bad. But it's not going to fly in this house. Stick around as we turn this rough stock of lumber into three of these beautiful, chaotic pattern end grain cutting boards. I picked up these boards from my local hardwood supplier. They're all different, but roughly 6 inches wide and 10 foot long. I'm cutting them down to 32 inches. Any longer than that, and it's going to become difficult to pass these boards over my jointer. We're using cherry, maple, purple heart, walnut, and wenge. These boards are S2S, which means surfaced on two sides. And although they were once flat and equal thickness, they've picked up some cups and twists over time. So we gotta take them over to the jointer and give them one flat face. A little paste wax makes it easier for the wood to pass over the machine and it makes the operation a little safer. The cherry and purple heart were too wide for my jointer. It's just a six inch jointer. So I ripped them down on my table saw jig. Next, every board ran through the planer, so every board has two coplanar faces. At this point, thickness doesn't matter. I can't achieve a straight and square edge from my jointer because the fence is whacked and beyond repair, so I use this jig and the table saw. I set these clamps to lock on the thickest board, and for all the rest of the boards, I use these shims. This makes it so I only have to adjust those clamps once. Cutting boards are a good way to use up scraps from other projects. Your pile of lumber is probably going to look different than mine, but this is what my pile of lumber looks like before ripping it into one inch strips. And all these boards are slightly different thickness, but at this point that doesn't matter. Now every board gets ripped into one inch strips. The wenge had a lot of tension, and as I cut the tension free the board started pinching the blade and the riding knife. So I used these wedges to open the board back up so I could finish my cut. This is what my pile of lumber looks like in one inch strips, and it's time for our first glue up. I turn every piece up on their edge for the first glue up, so these panels will end up being one inch thick. I'm using Type Bond 3 glue because it's more water resistant. I don't let my panels exceed 12 inches because I only have a 13 inch planer. Each glue up uses four clamps and I'm able to get two of these 12 inch panels per glue up. These clamping calls help keep the boards aligned. I wrap them in packing tape so the glue doesn't stick to them. I should probably have used three sets of calls here, one on each end and one in the middle. I waited 24 hours before running these through a planer, and even then some of the glue was still a little bit gummy. I tried using a card scraper to clean up the glue, but it wasn't doing much of anything. Wood glue and a lot of adhesives don't really stick to Formica, making it a desirable surface for an assembly table or a workbench. But scraping it off was a huge pain, and next time, I'll be using protection. I use a sharp chisel to clean the seams a bit, and then ran them through the planer to finish it off.
the sanding at this point was really unnecessary. For the rest of the build, I didn't sand between glue ups and everything turned out nicely. It's very important that your next set of cuts is set to the thickness of your boards. You want your next set of strips to be squares. I just want to say thank you for watching. Most of you aren't subscribed. If you're enjoying this video, hit that subscribe button, throw me a like. It really helps get my videos in front of the woodworking audience. I respond to every comment and love to see what you have to say. Thanks again. This is where the magic happens. Take your time to rotate the boards and evenly disperse your colors. Any really thin strips should be oriented vertically, otherwise they're just gonna get planed off. Then it's time for your second glue up. Tucked them in and gave them a kiss, and we'll be back tomorrow for some more cutting. Took the boards out of the clamps, scraped a bit of glue, and sent them through the planer. This next set of cuts will be at one and a quarter inches. And when I glue up my next set of panels, every piece will be turned on their edge and the panels will be one and a quarter inches thick. What was two 12 inch panels now combine to make one 12 inch panel, but they're thicker than they were before. Your third set of cuts will, like your first cuts, be the thickness of the boards. So you have squares that you can rotate 90 degrees and get a good mix up on your pattern. At this point I decided to cut my panels in half, so they were 32 inches, now they're 16 inches. At this point I'm able to get three of these roughly 12 inch panels. I pulled my panels out of the clamps, planed them, and cleaned them up. I'm pretty happy with my chaotic pattern at this point, and I'm ready to turn these into end grain cutting boards and do a final cut and glue. But first, I want to get all these panels the same size. This top panel is about an inch shorter than the bottom two, so I shaved a bit off the bottom two panels and glued them to the top panel, so I had three equal size panels. The thickness of each panel doesn't matter at this point. We're going to cut them to our desired finished cutting board thickness and turn all the strips up on their edge. I cleaned up the edges of every panel before cutting them into one and a quarter inch strips. this point I realized that if I keep going my pieces may run off of square so I finish the cuts using the table saw fence
Each piece from each panel has four orientations, and the key is to mix everything up the best you can so there's no trace of a pattern. You can grab the pieces just as they are, like I did with these first three. You can rotate the piece 180 degrees. You can flip the pieces. You can flip and rotate the piece. And we worked our way through until we had three well-mixed, equal-sized boards. I'm speeding through these glue-ups because it's more of the same. The panels are small enough now that I use three clamps per board. If there's any time to use clamping calls, it's now because any misalignment between seams will result in a lot of end grain sanding, which takes a ton of time. I learned this the hard way. You never want to run an end grain board through a planer there's a chance it could explode, and it's just not worth the risk. It's time to clean these boards up with a belt sander and get them looking nice. This belt sander was given to me by a family member. It's an expensive piece of equipment, and it's time is probably $250. There's a knob on the side that helps track the belt and keep it on the rollers. Unfortunately, this model is a complete lemon and instead of recalling it, they just discontinued it. No matter what I did, I was just eating belts. And as I did research, everyone was saying they've sent emails for months just to be ignored. So, after accepting that my belt sander's toast, I thought I could random orbit sand these down with 60 grit. Not even close. 30 minutes in, I had gotten basically nowhere. So, I busted out the sandpaper and spray adhesive and tried to flatten them with good old-fashioned elbow grease. And it was working, painfully and slowly. What if I put a handle on it and make it easier to grip? What if I put a weight on it? This is about all this sander is good for. What if I had a tool with a reciprocating motion? Please don't judge me. I was getting desperate. Spoiler alert, this didn't work. So, after blaming the world and cursing my parents for having ever been born, I went to the big orange store and got an orange belt sander. And I'm really impressed with its performance. The boards turned out surprisingly super flat. I spent over an hour and a half with 36 grit belt, which flattened them very nicely, but left a lot of deep scratches. Then I switched to an 80 grit belt, which cleaned up those scratches by making much shallower, smaller scratches. But my boards are flat, and they're looking pretty good. While cleaning up the edges on the table saw sled, something interesting happened. Like most table saw sleds, I glued and nailed a block on the back to protect me from the saw blade and to remind me not to put my fingers there. And as the off cut got sucked into the saw blade, it wedged into the curve and shot that block back and dented my garage door. The block grazed me right above the hip. It didn't hurt, but it left a mark. And it was a reminder why you should always stand beside your table saw and never behind it. I could have taken that block right in the stomach and it would have felt something like this. I put a round over on a scrap piece of wood to make sure I'm happy with the depth and everything looks good. Then I put a round over on the top and bottom edges of all three boards. The wenge was very prone to chipping. Be sure to go very slow and steady if you have wenge on the outside edge of your board. Now that my roundovers are done, I ran them more bit sanded at 120 grit until all those 80 grit belt marks were gone. This took a little while, but it's worth it. Don't stop sanding until all of those scratches are gone. I sanded all of the roundovers and all of the corners by hand with 120 grit.
I put a chamfer bit in my router and did a few practice passes on a piece of scrap. These are going to be the finger holds on the bottom edge of the board. Each handhold was done in two passes. The bit gets hot and can burn the wood, so the quicker you make that second pass, the less burning you'll have. Also, having a fresh and sharp bit will prevent burning as well. Then back at it with 120 grit until all the burn marks were gone. Time to raise the grain. This part's very satisfying. I sprayed four sides of all my boards and I let them air dry completely. Then I flipped them over and sprayed the bottoms as well. If you don't raise the grain, your boards won't be smooth after finishing, so this step's really important. This is the final sanding. I finished them off with 240 grit until the surface of the boards were smooth. You don't want to go higher than 240 because higher grits can close off the end grain. And we want that end grain to soak up mineral oil. When I bought this bin, I thought for sure my boards would fit in it, and I was wrong. But I just poured the oil over all six sides, let it sit for a few minutes, and then pour it again. Before finishing, spray your boards with compressed air and get all of the dust out of every pour. This is really important. I threw together this little drying rack, but my camera had shut off without me noticing because it was so hot in the garage. The final step is to screw these little rubber feet on. I went three quarters in from each edge and pre-drilled with a 16th inch drill bit. Put a small dab of glue in the hole to lubricate the screw and prevent any possible cracking or damage. Time for a haircut, buddy. I finished torquing each screw by hand. And just like that, We've made our first cutting board. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more, and check out some of my other videos.